my Nordic and Singaporean friends and colleagues, on the occasion of the Green Transition to a Sustainable Ocean Economy Seminar. A healthy ocean is vital for Iceland and climate change is already putting our oceans at risk, endangering the marine ecosystem. In this decade of ocean science for sustainable development, we build knowledge to facilitate action. And we need to collaborate with our international partners like Singapore to create momentum and opportunities for change. We are looking globally for solutions and we are focused on pilots and partnerships. Um, the way we triage um, and figure out what projects we should be focused on is to look at things in two dimensions. One is, of course, uh, the emissions abatement. So how much emissions can you, can you accomplish with the specific solutions that we're looking at? And then two is the technology readiness level and the commercial readiness index. It needs to be something that's ready to be piloted, right? And pilot, we're using this word to specifically mean putting it in water, testing it in real environments. Um, so those are the two dimensions that we look at. And then of course, uh, we need to think about the timeline. So the energy transition and the fuel transition is gonna take place over several decades. And so we want to look at both near-term, medium-term, and then of course, also long-term solutions. One in looking at drop-in fuels. So the idea of drop-in fuels is you've got these green fuels that command green premium. How do you justify the green premium across the supply chain? So looking at quality assurance, quantity assurance, abatement assurance of the green fuels across the supply chain. And the idea is once you iron all that out, you lower the barriers for ship owners, ship charters to come in and uh, demand and actually use the green fuels um, uh, that are available. If you look at our GHG emissions, in fact, for international shipping, it went up by 5% the past year um, when we're supposed to be bending the curve. So my hope and my aspirations for the shipping sector is that we take action now, we take action today. We do what we can with what we have now so we can begin bending the curve. Of course, we need to work on the long-term solutions. Those are hard and they're gonna take a while. But in the meantime, we need to start bending the curve Otherwise, uh, the challenge becomes even grander and it becomes even more challenging for us to think about decarbonization later on. We know today that we have uh, quite many ports in the world who has uh, a lot of problems with pollutions and, and for example, exhaust pollutions. And maybe one good example is when the, the vessel is coming overseas to the beginning of, of, of the fairway, then you can change your, your power plants from, from, from diesel power or something, ordinary power, to electricity. And then you need electricity motors you have already in, in your vessel, but the batteries. And I, we believe that uh, when we go towards to the zero emission area, we, we have the first of all, we have some kind of um, uh, hybrid systems. We have the ordinary plants and then we have the electricity based on batteries. All the new systems, they don't work at more if, if you there there's no di digitalizations for example when we speak about autonomous shipping and and components and systems with aim it to autonomous shipping everything bases in di digitalization i think that shipping has been developing for very many years. So we are sitting with a very strong heritage of behavior and practices that has been developed. Shipping is a self-organized ecosystem or is run under a self-organized ecosystem and there is no really power above 
uh, all the actors. Uh, so it needs to be run by more of collaboration. And as digitalization is borderless, that means that we can utilize digitalization as a glue to bring the different actors together. And if you think about, for example, a ship approaching a port, there needs to be communication going on between the different parties, the ship or the ship operators and the port and the port operators uh, in different ways. So, and here I think that digitalization is coming and providing us more and more connected devices, more and more opportunities to collaborate digitally, which means that we, we actually come to a situation where everything can become synchronized. Again, building up on that the ecosystem is self-organized. Uh, this requires that actors collaborate because this is an effort that cannot be a one actor effort. It's something that needs uh, very much of a collaborative alignment. It is collaborative alignment between competitors spread out all over the world. And what I hear and what I feel is that the future proofness when you do some investment, you need to know that this thing is going to last. That is very much vague at the moment, so therefore we need to bring up different alternatives on the table. And uh, at some point, we also need to secure that the regulations are pushed in the direction that we actually have these type of, of solution being brought to the table. So I think that it is a question of that the collaboration is not emerging public-public, public-private and private-private uh, enough. We deliver technologies that include uh, enhanced performance of the vessel, reduced energy consumption. We have uh, technologies that include, for example, hybrid and electrical propulsion solutions. We have uh, hydrodynamic uh, research that will give us the, the vessels the most optimum uh, uh, performance in the sea. And uh, when it comes to new fuels, obviously everybody knows that it's still, there are still some question marks in the world, which will be the next new fuel for zero emission vessels. But regardless which fuel will be the prevailing one or which fuels, we will be there with technology also for that. One of the key challenges the way we see it is that our clients are typically shipyards. We deliver equipment to the shipyards whilst the equipment itself has uh, benefits that actually the end user, the ship owner, the ship operator will benefit from. So part of our challenge is to sell this into the actual ship operator, the technologies. And sometimes we have to get the ship owners to understand and to believe in the technology, to see the benefits to them. And sometimes also it's uh, authority regulated new regulations come in from the IMOs and the likes, and that means also that the, the whole maritime sector has to slowly transition uh, to uh, uh, adopt these new regulations. I believe it's really important that we all consider what we can do to help solve the climate issues. We all have different spheres of influence, we have different ways that we can influence and it goes all the way from customer demand so we can start to select products to whatever extent is available and we can buy those. We can start to request products that are zero carbon uh, and, and as importantly also in our jobs whatever products and services we are working with we can start to ask the questions wherever we work as to how can we actually start uh, to work with our own companies, our own functions, to figure out what is our role in the value chain. So I believe everybody can actually uh, start to work on decarbonization and understand where is my company strategy in this, should my company have a stronger strategy in this, and how can I actually contribute wherever I am in the organization to get this going. I believe a lot of people are externalizing uh, the problem, thinking that somebody else will solve it either by inventing some new technology or by demanding a new law or regulation. And, and probably that is the case, that will happen. 
But it will not happen uh, by itself. It will happen because there is a push, there is a request, there is a demand for this to happen. And that demand has to come from the white society. So it's really important that everybody internalizes this and, and really thinks about what can I do wherever I am to help really get this going. But I have to say that when thinking about the technologies and the sciences that will make the biggest impact over the next three decades, I think we pretty much have them at hand. We pretty much know what they are. So even if I can think of really radical new technologies that could potentially make a huge difference, then actually I think we also have to focus on the solutions that are available within reasonable bounds. And those technologies are related to basically, I would say, four pathways of energy. So we need to think about renewable energies being produced as primary energy sources, whether it's green electrons or whether it's uh, blue fuels or whether uh, it is biofuels. And those can be turned into methanol, ammonia, methane or bio oils. And so these four pathways really provide uh, an energy and technology way of decarbonizing shipping. And our working hypothesis is that even if there's a lot of other opportunities out there, our job right now is to create confidence in these pathways so that we can get them going over the next five to ten years at scale. It requires a lot of ingenuity, requires a lot of business engineering, a lot of legal work, a lot of technology, maturation and development. But it doesn't actually require any radical scientific breakthroughs. We don't need fusion energy, for example, to do this decarbonization. So it's really important to keep in mind that we need to get that going. And then I'm sure at the same time, there'll be a lot of innovation happening on the side. There'll be a lot of search for completely new ideas.